Okay, my friends, I think I might have a little exciting news. It's exciting to me, and I'm not sure it's it's feasible, but I'm going to show you, and I think it is. They say, can we reverse combustion? Can we change the CO2 after we burn it and expand it? Can we turn it back into a fuel again instead of trying to sequester it? If we can turn it right back into a fuel again, that would be pretty fabulous, wouldn't it? All right, various effects are underway to find a cheap, efficient, and scalable way to recycle greenhouse gas carbon dioxide back into hydrocarbons that fuel the, the same process again. So you can continue to use it over and over and over and over, and you don't have to replace it. How would you do that? The only way you can do that is with electricity, because everything, one, it, it combusts and, and degrades, it drops down to a more stable state. We're going to pump it back up into a less stable state. How do you do that? You only can do that with electricity, and I'll show you exactly how we can do it, and I think we can do it in a fuel, in the, in the exhaust pipe of your car, and then just go, go right back and burn it again. Let me show you. Now, once again, one of these stories where somebody had the idea and nobody paid attention, but I can see it's absolutely going to work. 1990, graduate student Lin Chow, Princeton University, decided to bubble carbon dioxide into an electrochemical cell. All that means is he's got a, like a tube, uh, and he's bubbling it, and the carbon dioxide is going up through there, and he's injecting it with electricity, and what it does is it disassociates the oxygen from the carbon, because you're injecting it with electrons, and then the least number of electrons reattaches to the hydrogen, I mean to the carbon, which is hydrogen, and then you form hydrogen bonds. And that's exactly what he did. Nobody cared, and no one cared. All right, so he, what he did was he applied this just cheap stuff. He discovered applying electric current would assemble methanol from CO2. Methanol is, is hydrocarbons, and then you just reburn them. I think we can do that in a tailpipe of your car and just send it right back and burn it again, right back and burn it again, right back and burn it again. And here's how we can reassemble it using the Venturi. All right, just remember these names. Electron neutrino, muon neutrino, muons and electrons. These are attached together. CERN and none, none of them know that. They start attached together. That is literally dark energy, and it can be disassociated from the actual electron, and then I believe we can force those electrons right back into um, carbon and cause them to, 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 to arrange themselves in the hydrocarbon arrangements. Now you see right here. It's not a big problem turning CO2 back into hydrocarbon. It's just extremely expensive because they don't understand electron flood theory and the Venturi. It's in the transformation. There is at least three potential approaches to do so using sunlight, which is nothing more than electrons, along with a process employs high pressure, which forces them to crush through like the Venturi and temperatures. It's all related because the same exact hydrocarbons can be like butane or methane or ethanol or all kinds of different combustive part of exact same number of hydrogen and carbons depending upon the compression basically. Now just remember this. They, they don't understand about the Venturi and how to force and compress and put them high pressure and, and using just basic laser light. Um, it's an uphill process to convert CO2 to methanol. It means that they really have to push more electricity in than they will ever get back out. It's going to cost you some energy. The current rate of generating methanol is not high enough to be commercial. So they can't force enough electrons into that to make enough money back. So they pull it out of the ground. Now, I think I showed you this before. Don't forget, electron neutrino, muon neutrino. There's, There's energetic values to these that are so unbelievable when they are separated it's just incredible when they're together they are nothing more than an electron when there's back to back two of them back to back they are a photon let me explain to you all right i'm not going to get crazy going into very extreme depth but we saw remember you saw electron and a muon all right, an electron neutrino and a muon neutrino. That's what CERN says, and I agree with them, and I agree with the energies. Look at this, a muon neutrino, which was that black ball, has no energy at all, has less than 
1.17 mega electron volts. But when it turns into the boson of that, it's 80 giga electron volts. That's a bazillion times more value than it had when it started. Additionally, the electron and the muon of 0.5 mega electron volts ends up at 91 giga electron volts and even 105 mega electron volts. This is thousands and thousands of times more powerful when we saw them separate. And that is why we can squirt these white spray back into the carbon dioxide. It will disassociate the oxygen, then the hydrogens will come back in, put it back into the into the carburetor, <laughs> you just burn it again. You, you, you don't need to go electric you know, electric motors to run everything, which is, that's fine if you can. If you can get the electricity, okay. But we're just using push to shove, push to shove, push to shove, and then forcing electrons back in by, by just that compressed venturi forcing the magnetic regions to disassociate. Simple as that. Now, I told you, it's you can have the exact same number of hydrogens and carbons, and they can be totally different types of, uh, of um, explosiveness. And here's what it says. Due to carbon's versatility of bonding ability, the multiple molecules may share identical molecular formulas. Exactly the same. C, uh, C5H12. And, uh, well, in this case. Uh, and they, but could they have totally different three-dimensional structures. You see how... But you have hydrogens everywhere on the outside. It's always, 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 always hydrogens. Once you get rid of the hydrogens, you end up with this. You see, normally you have uh, the carbon and you have hydrogen surrounding it all the time. Once you do combustion, the hydrogens, they go off and expand. And oxygens come in and take their place. Instead of having a single bond, they have a double bond. That's less energetic. That's why this is the one that they can't get rid of and I say we can just send it through the Venturi, turn it right back into that. And here's what's happened that they don't understand on the earth. Hold on. This is, well let me just get through. Hold on. Alright, Here, and here's the other issue with scientists. They don't realize the entire universe is completely saturated with particles that are being emitted from every luminous source. We are primarily influenced by our sun, which is impacting its push-to-shove particles against our push-to-shove particles, creating what we call the ionosphere, extremely hot, because it's nothing more than our electrons and they, they are interacting with the hydrogen molecules out here forming OH minus and H minus and all these different very very small gaseous molecules are highly reactive. John Glenn saw them when he went through the atmosphere in 1962 and said they were like fireflies and they were being lit up all around him because they were absorbing the light of the sun and shifting out. He said they were eight feet apart. They were, they're exploding into eight feet apart because they're accepting that they're being pushed and exploding. Now that's why the corona out here is millions of degrees and the sun's surface only 6,000. You don't increase energy as you get away, you decrease. This is the, this exploding into the atmosphere surrounding it, scrubbing it, because the, earth, the, the sun scrubs through too, and everything scrubs through the arm and the Milky Way. So there's a ton of impact here going on, and that is what's forcing the electrons into us. And as far as I can see, there's no way that we can stop that. The only way we can help the earth is to stop from exploding it up this way. and Combustion is one of those extreme exploders because we're all we're doing is emitting gigantic hydrogen eight footers. Basically, when you're down on the surface of the Earth, I think they go down to eight inches or so. But out in space, they were eight feet apart. And the Russians did the same stuff. I've been following their research in the vacuum chambers and using ionized particles in space. Absolutely phenomenal. You can actually see the structure of particles. And I think, well, there's all kinds of stuff I think about that. We got so much to look into. But this is the disaster that's going on. They think this is a blanket. It is not a blanket. It has nothing to do with blanketisms. This is scrubism. And it, you feel heat. What do you think's going on here? A thousand miles an hour against that. 
it's not vibrating, but it's it's like you're turning your wheels on a on a pavement, burn it up. All you're doing is emitting electrons. And that's what happens all around our planet. And that's what causes the impact colors, because the colors are, are like on the north um, aurora borealis and so forth, the northern lights, you see them come down into different colors as they get closer to the earth, because as you get closer to the earth, molecules become more and more dense. It's, I, I think I have this figured out. I need somebody to get a hold of me. We could talk about this. All right, now, what I'm planning to do, I have a friend that has a radio show, and he also does Zoom meetings. He's a pretty, pretty technical guy, very intelligent guy, and um, I'm going to be doing shows with him at least a couple times a week. Try to get this information out about everything, about the mud fossils, about the energy, about health, everything. There's so much is wrong. That I mean, we could discuss this for forever, <laughs> and we will, I'm sure. All right, I love you all. All I'm doing is I don't care about anything other than just getting the truth out there. And all I want to have is a discussion. If I'm wrong, I'm wrong. If I'm right, I'm right. If I'm somewhere in the middle, I'm somewhere in the middle. That's all. I, just, I'm, I don't have to be right about everything. I just want my voice heard. And then we can discuss it. But up until now, it's just like that kid that found this 25 years ago. Nobody listened. Nobody cared. Same thing's happening now. I still love it. All right. I know that's a tall order, but I'm going to show you right now. I've been doing this a very, very long time. So this is where I get to brag. <laughs> 50 years ago, I pretty much understood that the, the atomic nucleus was just absolutely insane. To say that all of these little tiny particles could just come and, and hang around outside of a big positive that would suck them in. I, trust me, I'm just going to thumb through this. But this goes back a bazillion years ago. This is not yesterday's notes. <laughs> and I went through all the chemistry and, uh, you know, I, trust me. I will speak to anybody, anybody, anybody about this. And I think I have hopefully some possible solution. We need something.